Um, people have asked me uh, about my whole, kind of my whole testimony. And I've dripped a little bit here and dripped a little bit there. Well, I got an email about someone talking about faith. And I don't want to share the person's name. I do want to kind of read a little bit of the email because this particular email, it is to me, I think, um, other folks can relate to this. Let me find the email. I don't know what I did with the email. It's in here. I didn't, I did not delete the email. Um, what did I do with this email? I had, there it is. Um, there it is. Let me just read what this person said. She says, can you make a video? Is this, yeah, there's a woman. Can you make a video? Because I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who is struggling with this. Okay. I've been steadfast in faith with trusting God from protecting me from COVID. Never did take the shot. And now I have COVID. I'm trying to see where did I go wrong in my faith or trusting God on protecting me from this virus. Or can you explain what does it mean to truly have faith in God? Because I know without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I'm confused. I thought trusting him and leaning and depending on him will keep me from this, uh, which he has, which we have ever since it came out. But now I have it. I'm just trying to examine myself and see what I have done wrong. Now, let me say this. Let me tell you what faith does not do. Are you ready? Faith does not protect you from being harmed. Did you hear me? Faith does not protect you from COVID-19. Faith does not protect you from getting sick. Faith does not protect you from grandma dying or ma or pa dying. Faith does not protect you from your bills adding up. Faith does not protect you from having a bad day. Faith does not protect you from going through a storm. You know what faith does it also do? Faith doesn't guarantee that you will make it through the storm. There are people with a lot of faith who die in the storm. So what's the point and purpose of even having faith? Well, faith is like this. It's not that you will have to uh, uh, find a way out of the storm. Faith doesn't keep you from going through the storm. Faith doesn't guarantee you from coming out of the storm. What faith does, it guarantees who's going to be in the storm with you. Are you with me? That's the whole point of faith. I want you all to recall Jesus in the boat with his disciples. In Mark chapter four, verse 35 says, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across the other side and leaving the crowd they took with them in the boat, just as he was and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boats were already filling. But he, that being Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And look what he says. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said to the sea, I'm sorry, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the seas, or some of your verses may say the wind and the waves, obey? Can I tell you who he is? He's the creator of the wind, of the waves, of the sea. He's the creator of it all. And so all his whole point was, guys, what, what are you tripping off of? I'm literally here with, in this case, literally here with you. They marveled at what he can do, forgetting what he has already done. Faith is remembering what he's done, what he's capable of doing, whether he does or not, as the Hebrew boy says, whether he brings us out or not, we know he can. Whether he brings us through the storm or not, we know he can. Whether he will or not, doesn't matter anymore because faith is doing like Jesus was doing in the boat, just relaxing, just the fact that he's there. Do you have Christ as your savior? Well, then guess what? You're good. Whatever comes your way, you'll be good. Is it going to always turn out the way you want it to? Not always. No. Now, here's why I'm bringing this up. I've always been a person who, no matter what I go through, I felt like I could make it out. And I've got a track record to say, Corey, you'll be able to make it out. You're going to be okay. Let me tell you how I know. When I was born, the first day for me on this planet did not start off well. 
the first day that I was born, I almost died. Why? Because my father sold drugs, my mother used drugs, and those drugs that she used were in my system. And so they had to keep me in the hospital for a while to get the, the drugs out of my system because I almost died a couple of times. Once the drugs were out and I was I was able to breathe on my own and I was able to just to live, you know, without uh, their care and supervision, they let me go home. I didn't find this out until several years later, of course. The fact that it happened to me, uh, now seeing it later, gave me great comfort to know that, hey, you know what, uh, I'm tough. Now, I wasn't giving proper credit to who actually brought me out because at that time I was not a Christian. Now, life didn't get much better for me after that. We grew up in uh, gang infested areas, high crime areas, always moving, it was just really bad. We grew up in an era where they were starting to turn cocaine into free base with the, now, now it's crack or what have you. We saw that stuff. We used to make deliveries. We had two, two count them, hits put out on us. One hit was so bad that we had to leave the state. We left Indianapolis and moved to Milwaukee for a while just so we can be safe. My mother did the best she could. Now, she made some bad decisions, some bad choices, um, but she was always going to defend us. And I'll never forget one day mama was crying. And she said, when she was crying, I said, mama, you okay? She said, yeah, I'm okay. I said, you going to be all right? She said, I'm going to be all right because I have to be all right. And that kind of stuck with me that mom was going to do what she had to do no matter what. And my mother was a fighter. My father was a fighter. When he got out of prison, um, he met some people. And my father, if anyone is old enough, uh, they'll know who the name Jimmy Minor is in the state of in, in Indianapolis. Uh, my father was in organized crime. He was the kind of guy that you just didn't, you know, you didn't mess with. You didn't do certain things because he may not get you, but other folks might come and get you. We lived in some bad places. I mean, some real bad places. Um, but God brought us through. These people that came to kill us one night, they came through my room first. And their plan was to come through my room, then to my, my, my brother's room. It's the first time we ever had our own, our own separate rooms. Do you know why when they came through the room, do you know why they didn't get me first? My mother startled them and, and got up uh, with, her, with her weapon and chased them out. She startled them. But I should have been dead first because it came through my room. Do you know why they didn't get me? I wasn't a Christian at the time, but... There was a group of people called Youth for Christ, and they would come through the neighborhoods and they would pick us up. And so this particular weekend, they came and got us and took us camping. And so we weren't there. And so when they came, when the guys came through, because I was somewhere where God wanted me to be, they didn't kill me. My brother, he was with me too. Y'all excuse me. He was with me too. I didn't realize the magnitude of that or what God was doing, how he had his hand on me and my family at that time, but I do now. So my mother couldn't take care of me. She she didn't have enough money. And so she sent me back to stay with my father. My father was my, 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 he's my dude, my man. Now he's, he's passed away. My father was in organized crime. He, uh, he knows some people. He knows some people. I mean, when I say some people, the lowest to the highest, uh, the Marion County prosecutor, he, who became the mayor, who became, um, the, the, the person, the point person of George Bush's Office of Faith-Based Initiative, Goldsmith, Goldstein, Goldsmith, I can't remember his name, was on a first name basis with my father uh, because he kept trying to prosecute my father. My father had uh, IRS debts of 100000 80000 150000 and I know this because I saw the letters. And I'm thinking, okay, he owes this amount, of, this amount of money. I didn't realize what that kind of money was until later. Like, daddy owed that kind of money. Well, he was also a fighter. He taught me that you don't make excuses. No matter what you're going through, you ain't going to blame the white man. You ain't going to blame the black man. As a matter of fact, he said, if you want to find out who's probably going to be your worst enemy, it's probably going to be one of these N-words, and I'm, I'm trying to keep it keep it PG, uh, who's going to be against you. Because no matter where you are, I don't care if you're white or black, the folks around you are going to be the one that's going to be your, your, uh, more likely to hurt you. Well, he taught me no excuses. I, mean, I never can he told me this. This was my introduction to stop being woke. Uh, Ed, you'll like this. Dear woke Christian, you'll like this. This is how I was taught to not be woke. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have a woke chance in hell to become woke. He said, boy, uh, two things. You're going to do what you're told and you're going to bring home good grades. Don't bring home any D's or F's. I'm thinking I'm the slickest person on the planet. So 
I'm not really listening to him because I know how I was with, with my mother, but I'm with a man now. This is why fathers are important. <laughs> he said, don't ever bring a grade home and tell me that the teacher don't like you because you black. He said, I bet I never hear that come out your mouth. Now, he went through his old little diatribe and kind of cussed me out to put the fear of God in me. Well, I had decent decent enough grades, um, but I had a, uh, I brought a, was it a D? No, 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 no. It wasn't even a D. I had, you know, you, you get A in, in gym. If you're a boy and you don't get A in gym, something wrong with you, right? Uh, so I had a couple A's, uh, some B's, and I had a C. Now, his his belief was, if you can get a C, you can get a B. And if you can get a B, you can get an A. Bring me home my A's. If not, don't ask me for nothing. So I showed him my report card. He says, okay, son, is this it's a pretty good report card. You, 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 got this, you got this C here, so what happened here? I said, Dad, I said, man, it's, it's a tough class. I mean, and... and, and this teacher, she's just hard on all, it really, she's hard on all the black kids. I, she just don't like us because we're black. I forgot what he said. He said, uh-huh. Now, for some of you folks, uh, if you got a black parent and they're like this, uh-huh, you better duck. <laughs> he hit me so hard. And he said, little blankly blank, I, what did I tell you about saying a white man don't like you? He said, if you get the answer to the questions right, they ain't got no choice but to give you a little black A an A. If one plus one is two and you answer correctly, I don't care if she don't like you or not, she's gonna give you the right, she's gonna give you a check mark, right? <laughs> so I learned. I learned we don't make excuses. I don't care if the ceiling falls in, I don't care if the house catches on fire, you better fulfill your duty. You better be found with a uh, with a fire extinguisher or a water hose putting this fire out, coming out outside talking about daddy, if a house on fire, you better do something to fix it. Well, here's what happened. Um, I go to Texas Tech to play football. <clears throat> I was a knucklehead, guys, because, you know, when successes happen, you think that, eh, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. Um, things came quick. Um, I was a, there were two freshmen that were on varsity that year, two freshmen, myself and this guy named Bam Morris. Some of you all may know who he is. He played with the, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Chiefs. Well, what happened to Corey Miner? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I was a knucklehead and got put off the team. Went back home, and my me and my father got into it a little bit. I'm thinking I'm going back to the, to the school. I don't need you, Dad. I'm all right. I'm a grown man. And so I left. Well, my coach said, no, you can't come back. No, you, no, you ain't getting no scholarship. No, no, sorry. What are you talking about? You need to grow up. Ask your daddy to pay for it. Well, I just left my daddy. I just, my, my, I just told my daddy I don't need him. You know, come on, coach. I don't know what to tell you. You'll figure it out. So for one year, not even for you, not not for a year, but a few months, I'm homeless. I'm not even am I twenty? No, I hadn't turned twenty yet, and I'm homeless. And daddy is not getting ready to help me. He said, "You need to quit being a little b." And y'all know the word. Grow up and be a man. A grown man is going to take care of himself. You ain't got any kids. You shouldn't come to me for some money. No, I ain't giving you nothing. Show me you deserve some money. So what did I do? I tried to find every job I could. Um, I had a job selling fire extinguishers and even had an opportunity to uh, present the, this fire extinguisher, this Hayline fire extinguisher to this, distribu this distribution company who ended up taking this Hayline. They cut me out. I didn't know anything about it. They cut me out. And this was a multi-million dollar deal that I got cut out. Didn't know anything about it. I found out later. So could have been a millionaire. But anyway, but God knows what he's doing. So I work and work and work and save up money to put myself back in school. My mother, who at the time was still on drugs, comes in, and we're staying together. We're trying to help ourselves out, each other out. Um, either she or one of her friends took all my money that I was saving for school. Oh, I was hurt and angry. Um, she said she didn't do it. Uh, maybe it was such, a such and such friend or what have you. So what did I do? Went and worked overtime. Worked more and more just so I can have some more money. I'm going back to school, whether I play ball again or not. Now, I go to school and some people know me and they've seen some tape. And so I get invited to, the, to a regional combine. But what happens is this. Uh, I'm out there getting ready for this for this regional combine. They didn't have they didn't have it pro days like they do now. So anyway, um, I just hear this, just, just, I don't want to do this anymore. And I love football, but I want to do ministry. Let me speed this up. Um, I'm married at the time 
and I'm focusing on ministry. We moved from Lubbock to Dallas because it's hard to make a living in Lubbock, even though the cost of living is low. Uh, I am an investment advisor. I'm working for Edward Jones. Um, and so after I leave Edward Jones, I start my own firm. And I've got a nice little office and I get a bigger office and an extra offices and multiple employees working for me. And I'm feeling myself. I'm thinking I'm the baddest thing. Oh, by the way, at the church, I'm one of the uh, associate pastors and people are patting you on the back. Brother, Cor oh, Pastor Cor, Brother Cor, that was that was wonderful. And so you start feeling yourself even more. Well, here's what happened. Um. I'm always moving and I'm trying to make this happen here at the church, this happen here at home, and this happen on the job. Some of you all know this part of the story. I don't, and I won't go too much into it, uh, but I got frustrated at home just because I'm moving too fast. And uh, I ended up, unfortunately, having an affair. The worst thing that I could ever do in my life, have this affair. And I believe that was the beginning of my downfall. Um, because if I don't honor this woman, then God is not going to even hear my prayers. Well, what happened was this. Um, all of a sudden, it's like God just started blowing on everything. And so my the, uh, the vice president, he leaves. Uh, this person who's over our, our mortgage division, he leaves. This person over insurance leaves. Our main office um, administrator, she leaves. I didn't re realize how much she actually ran the office. Uh, then this other one, this operations manager leaves. It's like this happened, bam, 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 bam. Everything's happening. Lord, what's going on? Well, the Lord was trying to tell me, Corey, you no good. And so I'm going to deal with you, and I'm not going to deal with you the way that I deal with regular lay people. No, because here you are supposed to be a pastor, and I got something for you. Remember, guys, uh, people who teach, they are under a stricter condemnation when they fail, and I fail hard. What happened was, here it is, people are going to say, well, Corey, what happened to you? Why did you go to prison? What happened? Here's what happened. Because all these things were going on and I'm taking my, my eye off the ball. I said, you know what? I'm not going to let this business fold. So I took money from this guy's account, covered the uh, office expenses, and when fees or commissions would come back in, uh, I'd put it back in their account. Now, it may take a month or so for it to come back in, but in the meantime, they need a statement. And I would give them a statement that said uh, they have this when it really they really didn't have that. Because in my, my thought pattern, no harm, no foul. They're going to get their money back, right? I didn't have permission to do that, obviously, and the government does frown on that. Well, the federal statute that I violated was the federal mail fraud statute, statute uh, Title 18, um, Section 1341, mail fraud, to send a fraudulent statement through the mail. Well, it was my first time. <clears throat> Even though I grew up rough in some bad neighborhoods, I actually never had a crime uh, on my jacket before. I got caught one time um, with the, with some other kids still still some juice at the store, but they just called my mother on me and I got a whooping. Right, so nothing in my in my I'm saying in my jacket that's how, that's prison talk, but no no rap sheet, no no priors. So I'm thinking I am going to get you know a year, two, three years, maybe three at the most, possibly probation. This is the part uh, that really hurt me. When you're doing well, people like you. When you've got money, people like you. When I say we had money, we had money. I could I could take this card. I could buy every last one of you guys on here. Um, I can I can I can buy you. I don't know a microphone. I can buy you a camera. I can I can get you set up with your own YouTube channel. I, I can send you a. We were a millionaire, and. Um, all that, when you have that, people want to talk to you. They want to be your friend. Hey, Brother Corey, can you help? Can you this? Can you that? Well, um, as I'm going before the court and I'm asking, hey, can you all just come and just, just support me? They didn't. It's amazing how trials um, not only show you who you are, but it shows you who they are as well. And what God did was God got rid of everybody who... Otherwise, uh, did who I would not have gotten rid of, he got rid of them for me, I believe. People who I did not need in my life. Now, I won't tell you who the person is because I've had a couple of different pastors, uh, a few. But on the stand, um, he's hearing these things about me. 
Matter of fact, people from the from the from the other church, not the and somebody will say, "Is it Tony Evans?" No, it's not Tony Evans. Um, people from the other church, they hear about this. Um, no, I'm sorry, they haven't heard about it. And he's there as a character witness, but he's hearing all these things because you know the government is going to say that you're the worst thing since Saddam Hussein and Satan. And so he's hearing these things, and he tells the court, "This is my pastor who said I was like a son to him." And you all are going to be the first people to hear this. I haven't told this story in a while. He tells the judge, Your Honor, um, and that's my character witness, um, hearing these things about him, uh, this is not the Corey Minor that I've, that I've come to know. And so I think the best thing for him, uh, redemption for him, would be for you to give him the maximum amount that the law allows. Oh, I was floored. Because I, I didn't hear that right. You're telling, you're my former pastor, who was my pastor at the time, my former pastor, um, my mentor, and this guy was, was sh when I say sharp with the word, sharp with the word, you're telling the court to give me the maximum. The court's looking for any excuse to give me um, any kind of lenient sentence, and you're telling them to give me the maximum. So what did the judge do? Well, if your character witness, this pastor, this guy who says you were like a son to him, gives you, tells you, I should give you the maximum, then I'll give you the maximum. On a No one gets the maximum on a plea deal. Me. So, I'm devastated. I can't be angry because I'm, I'm, I'm too devastated right now to even know to be angry. Where do they send me? Not some, you, you all think that prison is cushy, fed, the federal uh, prison system is cushy. No, it ain't, it's not club fed anymore. They send me to what's called Bloody Beaumont. I don't know what Beaumont's like right now, but then horrible, Hor We could at when I left, we couldn't even wear steel toe boots on the on the compound anymore because they have stomped out. When I say stomped out, take their boots and stomped out guards. And uh, now it's okay to stomp out an inmate, but when you stomp out a guard, that's that's a problem. Uh, a whole lot of stabbings, a whole lot of killings. Um, one guy killed a guard to to kill to get his keys to go into another locked room to kill an inmate because they had a beef over a few stamps. Stamps were, 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 was money. That's why I say when, you, when, when guys sit and talk to me like, I'm not that guy, I haven't been through that, but you don't know what I've been through. And to survive that, because they're going to play with you, they're going to mess with you. Uh, they're going to want to uh, test your manhood or take your manhood, if y'all know what I'm talking about. Try not to be too graphic. And so <clears throat> I'm there and I'm like, Lord, why? Why me? All the things, I, I messed up, but why me? I shouldn't, come on, God. What's wrong with you, God? You're supposed to be God. My father, this what I get? I know I messed up, but come on. There are guys in here that have done all this other stuff, and they got five years, two years. But I get 20? You know what I'm going to be when I get out of this? Come on, God. So what did I do? I said, you know what? I'm going to just, Lord, you're telling me something. Clearly something that I wasn't hearing now I'm going. Now you've got me. You have literally, literally a captive audience. When he puts you flat on your back, that's because all you can do is look up to him, and that's what I did. I spent more time with him, and this is where I'm getting to the scripture. I spent more time with God. I understood God. I understood what He was about. He was not my genie. He was not the person that was going to make everything right for me. Because if that's the case, then everybody would be flocking to God. You, as he says, you didn't come to me because of who I am. You came to me because of what you could, what you can get from me. Well, I didn't want to seek his hand anymore. I wanted to seek his face. And so I stood there. Now, all the while I'm thinking I got a chance to win my case because, and here's a little technicality and it doesn't make me innocent. It just means that I wasn't necessarily totally guilty of the charge. <laughs> it sounds funny because when I sent those statements, I sent those statements by a local courier. Not a FedEx or UPS, because if they go out of, out of state, then it makes it FedEx. I mean, it makes it a federal case. So I didn't use the U.S. mails and I didn't use FedEx or UPS. I used a local courier and had the statement from them, an affidavit signed from them, and also an affidavit from my attorney saying that she didn't investigate. Of course, she turned around and, re and, and rescinded that. But I'm thinking I've got a shot to get my, my case should be tossed out. I have hope on that. But I'll never forget the day that the, 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 the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals denied it. You know, you ain't getting out. This is clear. Because I knew God had something better. Uh, there needed, there still needed to be some growth. 
And it couldn't be that I got out of prison because of something that I did. Because who would get credit? Me. But it had to be a move of God to to bring me out. And so that's what happened. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Joseph. How he now Joseph wasn't uh, the greatest of guys, and he hadn't really committed any crime other than the fact that he was a bit braggadocious and arrogant, and so he needed to be seasoned and taught. And I remember this time where Joseph was asking one of the men, "When you get out, tell the king, remember me." And I used to pray, "Lord, remember me, remember me, Lord, remember me." And it's like he wouldn't. One thing happened. My mother passed away. One thing happened, guys. Um, I stopped asking God to release me. Yeah, my kids are at home growing up without daddy. I talk to them over the phone. Uh, my wife's there holding on and things are things are tough. I mean, from what she went through to have everything, lose lose the cars, lose the house, and have to pick up and, and survive on her own. Uh, but let me tell you what got us through. What the young lady was asking about was about faith. Uh, God did not stop the bad things, the, the repossession, the, uh, the foreclosure. Um, them having to scrimp and scrounge for uh, some money, uh, my mother passing away, me having to do all this time in some horrible places and some horrible conditions. Some of you all don't know about, you're talking about uh, loose the chains. No, most of you have not ever had chains around you being shackled up or confined, confined to this little room and you're sleeping right beside your, your toilet with, your, with another inmate or in the room by yourself being in, being in solitaire or being in the chute. Not a good picture, not, 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 not a good lifestyle, but God was working on me and God was teaching me and he was growing me. And do you know that in that moment, I felt the most love from God ever. Not when I was up there and had money. That's not when I, when I knew he was God to me. I knew he was God, but when it really resonated, when I'm there and it's just he and I, it's just me and him, I'm sorry, alone. And I can read my Bible and I can pray. So what does faith do? There's one song, and I'll probably go ahead and play it because, and I may get a, get the, uh, uh, the the copyright strike, but it's not coming through the computer. You can just hear it in the background. But the song by uh, Marvin Sapp, My Testimony, So Glad I Made It. <laughs> I can't listen to the song and not cry because I know what he's done. I can testify what he's done for me. Because if he gave me one year and I got out, I'd be the same. But faith in the getting through part, it's the being with him while you're going through it. Are you with me? So no, faith doesn't protect you from COVID. You can think it is. You can think it does. And then once you get it, then what happens to your faith? You can know faith doesn't keep you from losing money because when you do, now what happens to your faith? Your faith can't be based on the things that God gives you. It has to be based on God, who you can have. I don't know if anybody's hearing this, but if you want 2022 to be successful spiritually, you need to just focus on God and whatever you give me. God, I don't care what it is. And I mean, mean, because we say it. We're good at saying it. You know, what they say, a pair of lips will say anything. We're good at saying it. But will you mean it? One thing I can say, the one thing the Lord can testify on me. God can testify on my behalf is that no matter how bad it got, I still, I still trust him. And I'm laying in my bunk bed in prison. And when that lady called my name to tell me that you're going home, we need your wife's address and phone number because we're getting ready to get you up out of here. And I had time left. You can't tell me. You can't tell me what God won't do. You can't sell me on anything. I know who brought me to the dance and who's taking me home. Amen. And so I'm telling you, if you want a successful 2022, you may have some things that you don't get. You might not get that car, that job. But if you get more time with him, because what do they say? Who is this man who even the winds and the sea obey? I know who he is. The one who delivered me out of that prison cell. What does he say? Uh, let me give you this passage and we'll go ahead and end. <clears throat> I want you to see the passage. He says uh, in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, 
in due season. If we do not give up, we will reap if we do not give up. In due season. Guys, what that means is not when you think it's your time for the season, not when you think it's time, but in, in due season, in his season, when he knows you're ready, you shall reap your reward. Is it going to be a car? Probably not. Is it going to be a new husband or new wife? Maybe. Is it going to be all your bills paid? I don't know. But you know, whatever you're going to reap, you know whose hand it's going to be attached to? It's going to be attached to him. So do this for yourself. Be faithful and mean it and watch 2022 be a blessing for you. Amen.